Right, hello. Um, I'm Trevor Ward, and I'm going to give you a talk about keeping within the box. Actually, I'm going to give you a talk about what you can put in the box and how to use it. Firstly, though, I have to give you a talk from my daughter. When I was sat down talking with the family about this presentation, my rather cute 12-year-old blonde daughter said, I'll write it for you, Daddy. And she said, oh, we'll do this. We'll say that computers are fun. Thank you, that's it. Oh, you should mention who you are. <laughs> we then went down and said, actually, it's about a 40-minute talk. Might not be long enough. But I did have to put that in, as anybody with daughters. No, she'll object if you don't. Right. The box. As you're aware, you've all got tools within your arsenal for developing applications and everything else. So let's have a look at how we can utilize those tools and what we need to look at before we continue to actually build an application. And the first tool we have, being a mobile developer, if this works, is the application. That's not the finished application, that's an idea in your head, a business requirement. Somebody's come up to you and said, I've got this great idea to build a Toys R Us app for people comparing prices or something like that. That's the first stage of any application, is the idea. From that point, you then have to go down, what do you want to do next? Do you have any back-end requirements? And with the back-end requirements of an application, we're talking, how do you build that? What data do you have? What information do you need to provide? And where's it going to come from? The, sorry, the a way to provide back-end services nowadays is to forget the front-end <coughs> and build yourself a middleware set of APIs. So if you're going to use something like Google Places, they have APIs which feeds their data. You keep your data separate to your API feed, separate to your front end, at which point you can then put whatever front end you want on, whether that be mobile, web, desktop, or any of the other multitudes which may come out in the next few years. But having that set up as your back end gives you the ability to just rewrite your front end UI. Third party services. So within this app, what are you going to use? Are you going to use Twitter, Google, location services, stuff like this? On location services, I, I don't know if you're aware, but to do lookups and reverse geocoding, you have to have a service provided by that. Accelerator provide that for Titanium, so all you do is use their API and it gives it you back. But there are other services you can use to get that information. And the third thing about the application is user expectations. What does the user want to see? What will the user expect? How will they use the app? And is it what they actually want? Get those three right, you suddenly start to um, go, OK, got that sorted. Devices. There are a whole plethora as you're all well aware, from the PC, mainframe, Unix boxes, web, mobile. But there's massive differences. With mobile, you have a closed box. You cannot suddenly go around and go, to use my app, you've got to put another two gig of RAM in there. Ain't going to happen. And I've come across people who've said, how can I do this? How can we upgrade the device because the app won't run? How can we put 2,000 lines of data into a table view? It ain't going to happen. You know, you're going to break the device. On the desktop, it works fantastic. On a computer, you can turn around and say, you've got to have this specification of it. On a mobile, you can't. You are stuck with what you've got.
Now, looking at my notes, there's one other thing. How many people here have iPhones? About 40%, I was expecting more than that. How many have Android? Blackberry? Yeah, I know you'd have one, Liz. <laughs> Windows 8 or Windows? And who doesn't have a smartphone? <laughs> you may laugh, you may laugh. The couple of us sat next to you on the plane, they were playing with their phones and it was all Nokia and flip phone. I think it was a Nokia. But, you know, they were going, why can't I get the web? How many with an Android have rooted it? How many with an iPhone have, what's the word, hacked into it, um, jailbroken it? Okay. How many people are now developing using that as a test device? Great, because what you're using is a device which nobody else has. If you root your phone and you jailbreak your phone or you hack it, you suddenly have got a device which will run your app beautifully. But the person sat next to you with the same phone can't run your app. So if you're going to jailbreak your phone or you're going to root it or anything else, do not use it as your test device. Do not use it as your development environment. It's a geek's way of having fun with phones, but it's not a good way to develop applications. Right. Requirements. What does a device require to do? So when you're conceiving your application and you're looking down and you're doing all the planning, what is the requirement of that application? Are you going to target a spe specific device? So are you going to target a Nexus 7 or an iPhone 5 and restrict who's going to be able to use it? If you're doing a business application, which is an in-house app, which is never going to go onto a market anywhere else, you can do that very, very easily because the business dictates which, dictates which mobile device you're going to use. And there's a few people, including myself, around this room who do purely that, we very rarely release to the marketplace. So we know what specific device exactly they're going to be using. Most of the time, though, you're not going to know that, so you're going to need to know what requirements you are. Do you need to do Android? Do you need to do um, iPhone, etc.? And the final thing about devices is users. We've covered what happens if you root or you jailbreak your phone the users. What users are going to use this? What devices are they going to have? With, a, with iPhone, you're pretty, pretty standard, it's going to be X, Y, or Z. With Android, you know, you've got a whole different ball game with all the devices which are out there and everything else. And if you're aiming at the Android market, you can now restrict it to specific devices. Um, so look at your user base and how you're going to do that. Okay, native versus framework. How many people are going to expect me to turn around and say titanium is not your first choice of platform? Good, because I'm going to say it. Titanium is not your first choice of platform. Because at this stage of an application development, you don't know what you want to use. Yeah, Jeff should be somewhere around. He'll slap me later for it. How do you know what technology to use until you've taken care of the first two points? You've decided on the application. You know what devices you're going to aim for. You know what your user expectations are. You know what back-end services, if any. Yeah? And with back-end, I also mean internal data. Internal data is also a very big requirement of what you need because if you put too much internal data in, you're going to blow the size of your, of your app. So, you've got to that point, and you don't know whether it's going to be better to write native or framework. If you are purely doing a specific Android device, 
application, which includes lots of graphics and UI and customization, Java may well be the way to go. If you're doing iPhone or an iPad application, you're never going to do anything else, Objective-C may well be the way to go. I'm not going to continue the talk down that route, but <laughs> you do not know until you sit down and you analyze what you want to do and what your target platform is, what you need to use. So what is the right technology? You can answer it by the analysis of what you want to do. And a couple of things which I hope you're aware of is native will always run faster than framework applications. Native applications will also be smaller. However, nowadays, the size of the application isn't generally, if you take Titanium and Objective-C, the difference in the size of the application isn't really noticeable because the biggest part of the application nowadays is the assets whether that be the images, whether that be the internal data, whether that be the actual code base itself, but that is the biggest part of it. So there's very little difference nowadays. So, having decided to go down the Objective-C route, no, sorry. <laughs> will the framework do the job? The simple answer is, if at this moment in time, if you are writing a business application, an application which consumes and processes data in great amount and doesn't do too much drawing and graphic manipulation, Titan, Titan, Titanium is a fantastic platform and will pretty much do everything you want it to do, regardless of what the application is. And with a couple of the um, developments which are going on, Lucinda, and I'd have to speak to the, type, the accelerator guys to find out the other one. The graphical, the drawing capabilities, the 2D, 3D animations and all that sort of stuff is coming. Would I write a three, a, a one, sorry, would I write a single shoot them up person game in Titanium? No. Wouldn't do it that's pretty much a native code to get it to do everything you want. Six months down the line, that may be a different story. And what do you need to consider? Will the technology do everything you need it to do? Does it have the APIs into the device for you to be able to do it? If you're doing an augmented reality app, does it have a Compass API? It's a fundamental thing to check, and I fell foul of that one a couple of years ago. I started working with Adobe's new Flex framework, writing a mobile app. Got the augmented reality stuff, fantastic view, beautifully, no worries whatsoever, until there was no Compass API built in. Get hold of Adobe, they're never going to build it in, so we have to scrap that technology, which is our how I came into Titanium, because it did. You have to know what the framework will do and the technology will do before you can actually start using it for your application. Right, I've got a final note there. If halfway through your development, you suddenly find the framework or the way you're doing it or the technology you're using won't do it, you can't suddenly go back. And I've seen this too often within the Q&A, people slamming Accelerator, your framework is crap, it won't do this. Okay, no it won't. That's not Accelerator's fault, that's yours for picking the wrong technology. Yeah? Right, as I said, <laughs> we're here primarily to talk about Titanium and, and stuff. And I make my living purely coding Titanium. I don't do any other coding whatsoever, so I am a big, if you like, fan of the base. So you've chosen to do Titanium. Don't jump straight in. The biggest mistake developers make 
or people who are writing HTML using Dreamweaver, which I assume it will not be most people in this room, make, is they can go, it's JavaScript, boom, we can use that. You can't. This is not JavaScript as the web knows it. This is JavaScript applications. And for those who have been developing Titanium for a while, that becomes pretty obvious very, very quickly. This is not web-based technology. And it will not give you the ability to take what you've got on the website and plug it straight in and use it. If you want to do that, phone gap. Does it really well. Yeah? And if that's your requirement, that's the framework and technology you should be using. But there is an overhead with phone gap, but I'm not going into that. So don't ju jump straight into going, oh, great, I'll download this and I can start coding. And start coding your app. That would be a big mistake. Hmm. Plan your strategy. As developers, we quite often sit down and go, an analyst has written, do we still get, does anybody here still have analysts actually spec out the application before they start writing it? Zero. Oh, one at the back, yeah. When I started coding, I started COBOL. They moved into Perl very quickly. But we used to have separate analysts who spec'd out the app and then gave us a whole specification of what we had to do before we started writing it. I'm not saying you have to go that far back, but with mobile development, you, you're not going to jump a lot further before you start. Because what you're going to end up with, with, an, with an, is an app which is badly performing, badly structured, and very difficult to maintain going forwards. So you need to plan your strategy. You need to plan your strategy of your code base, of your application architecture, and of what your APIs and how you're going to access them. So if you're doing HTTP requests and accessing APIs, separate that code out so you can maintain it going forwards. Alloy, which I'll come on to later, is going to make that job a damn sight easier for you because it's going to enforce you to stick to specific coding practices. Is it the right way to go at the moment? We'll find out later. And the third one is train your staff. Again, Titanium's been around since 2009. Version 3 has been around since January. Version 3 is very different to version 2. Version 2 was incredibly different to version 1. Yeah? Version 2, I did all the training on, I got all the certificate and qualifications and became a trainer to be able to do that. Can I train you at this moment in time in version 3? No. My skills aren't that up to date. They will be by the end of um, next month. So, we come on to understanding the technology. The image is a bit crap, but that book was released yes yesterday or today. I can't remember. Be patterns and best practices, we'll come back to that. Understand the technology. Continuing from the tra train the staff. At this current time, on the Accelerator website, you can get the BNAP book. You can become TCAD qualified. You can become TCMD qualified. You can become TCM, TCDE, educate, qualified to teach the stuff. And the videos and everything are all there, and you can view them, and it's fantastic. And 80% of that is still relevant. The training, the qualifications, certi certifications, and everything else is changing. The new I've seen most of the new training material, and it's pretty damn good. Tim Paulson has done a fantastic job from Accelerator on updating the training material, and he's continuing to do so. But if you are currently TCMD qualified, end of March, there's going to be a new qualification, TCD. And there's new material, there'll be new videos, training videos, and new training courses all out. So, like I said, at this moment in time, I'm TCAD, TCMD qualified, etc. 
but that's outdated because version 3's come out and version 3 has a lot of new stuff in it. So not only do you need to understand the technology by doing that, not only do you need to take a course, well, you don't have to take a course, you can take a course. You can take one of the official courses. I think there's one running for two days after this. But 80% of that is still very, very relevant and will give you a really good grounding into how to use titanium. But there's 20% which has now switched focus. And I'll, I'll give you the example. Last year, about this time last year, version 2 came out in January. Version 2 took you from using TI include and the namespace object within JavaScript applications to using the common JS approach. How many people still use TI include in their code? <laughs> really? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, qualified trainers just said <laughs> he still uses TI include. Common JS came out. It was a massive learning curve, a massive difference. This one's about the same. This release is about the same. So take a course, get your skills up to date. Use the resources. How many people here knew, know that there are training videos freely available on the Accelerator website? Okay, training videos freely available on the Accelerator website. From zero to hero, if you like, get yourself up to speed. Get your staff up to speed. Get your colleagues up to speed. And as Jeff announced right at the start of today, Every 12 to 16 months, they're doing a major release. Every 12 to 16 months, you are going to need to sit down and spend probably a full week's worth of time, depending on how fast or slow you learn, in getting your skills up to date to keep up to date with this technology. So, if we take that, before I come up to that, the next one, have you picked the right framework? comes all the way back to, right, the first slide, when you've got the application and you've decided what your platform is, the, the framework is changing, the mobile devices are changing, what is the easiest thing to, for you to keep up with? Is it, is, it, is it easier for you to do using titanium, thinking that you've got a week or so every year where you've got to update your skills? Or Objective-C and Java where you just continually update your skills as things change? Only you can decide that and only you can say whether this is right for your project. I can tell you that at this moment in time there is more and more people using this framework because it does what it says on the tin and it handles it really, really well. And what is another really good way to keep up to speed with what's going on? Ask and answer questions. How many people here have used the Q&A forum? How many people here think the Q&A forum search and navigation is dodgy? <laughs> okay, but how many people find the Q&A forum incredibly useful? If you've not used it, it is one of the most useful resources you can possibly wish for. You have people like Mark, Ket, I can't see him, Boyd, <laughs> yep, myself. We, we monitor those forums. I have it on Twitter feed, so I see every single question which comes in. And then you just go and, and we go and answer them for you. From your point of view, for keeping up to speed with how the technology works and what you need to know and everything else, answer questions. Don't answer questions you know something about. Answer questions which are sat there and you think, I should know something about that one, but in the application I'm working, I'm not touching that part of the framework. So go and work out what the answer to that question is for somebody and give the answer. You've suddenly taught yourself not only that part of the framework, but you've also helped somebody out. And that is how a lot of us keep our skills right up to date, is by going in and going, I've never come across that. Okay, quick hack, quick nod a little app to test it all out resolve the issue and give the answer back. It is a really, really good way of keeping your skills right up to date. Okay, modules and plugins. How many people here use modules? Ooh. 
How many people here use modules which you could code yourself? I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pick on you, I do apologize, but barcode scanning. Did you know you can pick up an open source JavaScript library which you can plug straight in as JavaScript without a module which will, ban which will scan barcodes? How many people knew that? Because you can. How many people know that you can pick up security libraries in JavaScript, just plug them straight into the app and use them? Encrypting all of your code without having to plug in a module. Okay, right, back to the barcode scanning. No way will it work that well. It is absolutely shit. It does, you really do have to focus the image well and do everything else. So that's why I use that, because that technology is awesome. Another show of hands. Whose first response when they don't know how to do something is to try and find a module for it? Okay, we haven't got any basic programmers. Awesome. Because that is a lot, you see a lot in the Q&A forums. I'm trying to do this, I've plugged the module in and it doesn't work. That's because they don't understand what they're doing. Modules should be used sparingly. If you can do it within the code, you're going to reduce the size of your app, you're going to increase, enable the performance, but you're also going to be able to give yourself that ability to maintain that code. A module is a closed box. You can't maintain it, you can't modify it, you can't keep it up to date. You are restricted by the people providing that module. So unless you absolutely have to use a module, don't. However, Saying that, there are advantages. So you don't use them by, the, by default, but there are advantages to using modules. It could take you two weeks to write a security module to encrypt your code base and everything else as you're doing it. You could use a module which takes you two hours. You have to decide the pros and cons because that security module might change three months down the line and not be able to do what you want to do, and you'd have to take it out and put a different module in, whereas the code base you've got can. So speed and functionality in modules helps, but base code and it gives you the flexibility to maintain it yourself. However, modules where you can't do in titanium what you need to do, um, we use one in our app for the key store. You can't actually store passwords through an API to the iPhone security store. So we use a module to do that. And that's where modules really, really do pay benefit. Okay, how many people to use something like jQuery? I'll put JS query, sorry. jQuery. Okay, I don't have a big enough bomb. <laughs> jQuery, you are using a web view to create your code and you're building jQuery into it, correct? Yes, no? Yeah, no, jQuery within Titanium, not jQuery within web. How many people are trying to build jQuery in Titanium? No, jQuery on web, fine, yeah? How many people are using jQuery on Titanium? Or another module like that to enhance the web view? Awesome. That's another common thing we come across where people go, I want to do this. I'm going to do it in HTML. I'm going to use a web view and I'm going to use this query to do it. At the moment, that's really the only effective way you can do uh, charting properly and thoroughly in Titanium is to do that using the web view and a plugin chart module. That's changing very rapidly, but at the moment, that's the only way. And that may be acceptable, but at the end of the day, web views are resource heavy, incredibly cumbersome, and what you're doing is extending the web kit to facilitate something which, at the end of the day, your app should probably be in phone gap. Yeah? And all of those things to do with modules, the plugins and everything else, add to the size of the app, add to the performance of the app. Okay, user tools. TI Studio. 
Who loves the new command line interface using Node.js? Who's tried it? Who are she geeks who like Unix and Linux? <laughs> oh, same hands. <laughs> the command line interface is an awesome addition to Titanium. Fantastic for people who are literally like command line interfaces. It enables you in certain circumstances to do stuff which you wouldn't normally do. But the best tool to develop Titanium is Studio. Aptana, who provides Studio via Accelerator, have been around a long time doing specialised Eclipse um, IDEs. I've used, I've used them for years, the Eclipse IDE from Aptana for various other stuff. But Studio is a good tool. If you can't get it to work, it's variably something wrong with your setup. If you suddenly hit problems and go, why isn't this working? It's invariably something wrong with something you've done. One of the biggest bugbears for people who troll the Q&A forums is somebody going, my app used to compile in Studio, it doesn't now, and we just ask, what have you done? I just updated my code, it doesn't work. And this is Studio's fault. Yes! Actually, it, 99 times out of 100 turns out to be their code. But if you're doing that from the command line, there's very little you can do. But from Studio, it does actually show you quite a lot of information on hand. How many people use JS Lint? How many people know what JS Lint is? Oh, the same sort of geeks I saw who like Linux and Unix. <laughs> Who doesn't know what JS Lint is? Right. JS Lint is a code checker. It's built into Studio, but it's not switched on by default. And it will tell you if you've missed a comma, got a semicolon wrong, put a plus in the wrong place, and is your best and worst nightmare. Because when you start using it, it comes up with all these errors which you have to go through and fix. But by doing that, it makes coding in Studio quite nice because as you code you suddenly get yellow and red warnings if you've done something stupid. Alloy. Who's played with Alloy yet? It's the same hands again. <laughs> Alloy has the potential of being awesome. It really, really does. Version 1 was released this week or last week? Yeah? Out of beta. Tony, the guy who's working on it, I had the, pl the pleasure of sitting down with two or three weeks ago and having a chat about Alloy itself. Going forward, it's going to be awesome. But do you need to apply it? And we're going back to, right at the beginning, what technology do you use? Do you actually need to use Alloy? And without understanding what Alloy does and how it does it, you can't answer that question. And that actually takes us back to the training. Alloy is released in version 3. So without updating your skills and knowledge base, you can't make the decision of whether you should be using Alloy or not. There's people around this room who I know who will just go, Alloy's there, great, boom, and start coding in it. And go, this is fantastic, this doesn't work. But they're the people who, if it doesn't work, We'll get back to Tony and go, this ain't working, mate, and we'll resolve the issue with them, not suddenly go to the Q&A forum and go, this isn't working, how do I do it? And Alloy at the moment is at that stage where it's just been released, and until you understand it fully, don't implement it. But once you've got into it, and you go, yes, this is the way I should be going, implement it. Yeah? And I have a feeling that when version 4 comes out, Alloy will be the de facto standard. It is looking that good at this moment in time. Okay. Penultimate slide. So we're actually going to finish the day on the time. Testing. How many people test their app? How many people properly test their app? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I like this one. Test, test, and test again. 
It may seem obvious. It may seem stupid. How many people get other people to test their app for them? And I think that sums it up. 20%-ish. You test the app, you thoroughly test the app, you know how the app works, you know what it should be doing, you will miss the errors. Like me, you're dyslexic, you'll also miss the spelling mistakes. It's incredibly important to make sure that your app works properly for the people who are getting it. It's not Titanium's fault if your app fails. It's not the App Store's fault or Google Play's fault if the app fails. And what consequences that will have of not being tested properly is bad years of experience, they download it, doesn't work, deleted, never touch it again. Until it suddenly becomes a viral app which everyone has to have. Which ain't going to happen if that happened, I can assure you. Because for something to go viral, unless you're using an enclosed market of a business where you have to have that app on your, on your thing, you have to use that app. The first couple of weeks are vital because it's those initial people who find it and try it and start chatting to their friends whether that app will start to get used or not. And if they can't use that app, they'll go, don't bother. The reviews, this is crap. And that review will always be there. If you have got an error, even if it's a spelling mistake, fix it. Yeah? It's those sort of things, it's the little things which you think, oh God, the help screen. How many people put a help screen in, or an information screen, into their app about how to use it? Okay? That's the last point on the slide. But if you've misspelled, misspelled, on the app, somebody will notice. Yeah? It may be a small thing to you, but to somebody else it's big. As I found out when I forgot to put some information on the information screen for a customer and they returned it as a critical error. To me it was nothing, but to the user, without that information on the information screen, they didn't know the full information of the app. So they returned it as a critical error in user testing. That's what testing does. Six to ten testers, you don't need any more. If you have more than that, testing your app initially for you, you'll suddenly get people going, oh, have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? Rather than, this isn't working. You need to change this workflow. You need to change this process within the app. Yeah? Exceed that, you start getting lots and lots of suggestions of how to improve it. And what maybe should be coming out in phase two, Phase three releases, not in your initial release. Now once you've done that, user acceptance. Extend it. Extend that testing out to friends, family, colleagues, whatever else. But test that app and test it from a user's perspective, from somebody who's never touched it before. Because that is the critical audience for your app. The people who have never, ever touched it before. And if you've done something weird with the UI, with the uh, flow of the app or anything else, they're going to get confused and not use it. And it's better you know about that before you release it to the App Store than getting it back and getting all bad reviews because they couldn't find the help screen which you'd hidden underneath yeah. a special button on the screen. Help screens, information screens, manuals are a thing of the past, but they're not. A simple information screen, not a setting screen, not a how, where do I go to find out information, but it's a simple information screen which is clearly and easily accessible, which tells them how to use the app. Any, any idiosyncrasies you put into it would reduce your acceptability of that app by those users greatly. 
they suddenly go, why doesn't this work? And they go, oh, we've got an information screen. Oh, that's why, because it's not supposed to work that way. It works the other. Maybe a bad UI on your part that you've actually gone against standard design, but having that information there enables you to go back and go, read the manual. Okay, before we go on to questions, that comes down and back to something I was doing 25 years ago when I started coding. Basic development principles, which for mobile applications and people coming in who go, you can have this, you can do this, you can update the memory in a, in a computer, you don't have to worry about resources or anything else, you're back to where we were 25 years ago when I was using green screens on Unix boxes. You have that restriction and you need to apply the coding principles and development principles which were around then, today, to produce effective mobile apps. Okay, I think that's about it. And we have time for questions, if we have any. I'm quite happy if there's not. Okay, um, finally then, top one's the first book I wrote, if you ever want it. <laughs> you have to sell things at the end of this, that's that one, if you want to know what it is. And this one, with Boyd over there, Wave Boyd, <laughs> was released yes yesterday or today, is available, patterns and best practices. And that's it, mate. A round of applause for Trevor. Thank you.